All right, guys. <clears throat> it is an absolutely nasty, I just mean yuck, freezing, drizzly, dark gray, depressing Sunday morning here in the uh, collapse of everything on the planet here in the waning days of 2018. We got two days left in the historic year of 2018. So, uh, I love it because Sunday morning is when I can uh, wear both of my hats here as I bring you my combination doomsday sermon from your old preacher and my daily chronicle of the collapse so I can I can cover two YouTube channels with one uh, with one sermon and we're going to close out 2018's doomsday sermons with a with an essay well a couple of essays from this fellow named Ken Orphan. Ken Orphan describes himself as an artist, sociologist, radical nature lover, and weary but committed activist. And uh, Ken is a regular contributor to, uh, to Counterpunch where I just put in my yearly donation to Counterpunch and it encourage you to support Counterpunch and Common Dreams, who I also just donated to. But uh, we're going to read just a couple of paragraphs from Ken's essay, The Power of Language in the Anthropocene, and then we're going to come back and read the full essay, Bearing Witness to Extinction, to wrap up 2018's Doomer, Doomer uh, Sermons. And take it away. Let me put a little dog. Take it away, Ken Orphan. I'm going to send Ken a note and see if he wants to come have a conversation about the collapse of everything and the Anthropocene and the sixth mass extinction. But this comes from uh, an essay he wrote earlier this year, The Power of Language in the Anthropocene. I'm just going to read two paragraphs and then move on to the main essay. <clears throat> The zeitgeist of the era, meaning <coughs> our era in 2018, demands a kind of militant optimism and the denial of reality. One can see this in a simple test. Mention the words climate change in the comment section of a report on a hurricane or wildfire <coughs> on almost any mainstream news page and you will see a flurry of laugh emojis and comments of ridicule. Such coordinated assaults on reason have the fingerprints of denialist think talks like the Heartland Institute all over it. <clears throat> but, even me, but even many self-described progressives Self-described progressives perpetuate a language that denies the lived realities of millions of people or pose solutions that do nothing to dislodge the failed and utterly corrupt capitalist paradigm. They, meaning the, the lefties, insist on political solutions, even pseudo-socialist ones within a bipartisan framework that has proven to be a sham. And how has this helped anyone? In the U.S., 
most live in a state of perpetual stress and distraction, distracted by the demands of work, shrinking social safety nets, and a political landscape that is merged with mass entertainment, the corporate surveillance state keeps the masses in line by neutralizing public opinion, policing thought, and censoring dialogue. Many live in states that are destined to experience more and more catastrophic flooding or prolonged and entrenched droughts thanks to climate change. And of course, here in Texas, we have both, and don't forget the heat waves. <clears throat> As a species, we have either created, permitted, or have been oppressed by an order that has been threatening our collective demise for decades in what amounts to a mere blip of geologic time. Indeed, it is this order that has already sentenced countless species to the halls of extinction, carpet bombed millions over the last century, justified slavery, devastated verdant regions, and enslaved millions of people around the world for profit prisons, sweatshop fire traps, pesticide ridden fields, and lung choking mines. But we should understand that the language of this era is no accident. It has been carefully crafted by the forces of capital to control the dominant narrative, condition our thinking, and dictate how we will act. It is designed to keep us distracted while they keep up their pillage. <clears throat> The beginning of dissent and resistance, then, lies in learning a different tongue. Yes. Learning a different tongue, otherwise known as the language of the Dubosphere. But uh, we're going to jump ahead to Ken's most recent offering and counterpunch that he just came out with two days ago titled, Bearing Witness to Extinction. Yes, he starts out with a couple of quotes, quoting Carl Sagan, Extinction is the rule, survival is the exception. And then, quoting Elizabeth Colbert from The Sixth Extinction, An Unnatural History, <clears throat> To argue that the current extinction event could be averted if people just cared more and were willing to make more sacrifices is not wrong exactly, still it misses the point. It doesn't much matter whether people care or don't care. What matters is that people change the world this capacity predates modernity. Anyway, getting uh, diving into Ken's <clears throat> end of 2018 roundup. According to a study by the World Wildlife Fund, the Earth has lost over half of its wildlife in just 40 years a staggering statistic that should shake every conscious person to their core. Each of us is a witness to this great dying, the sixth mass extinction, the last one being 65 million years ago, which wiped out the dinosaurs. Yet, despite overwhelming evidence of a rapidly crashing biosphere, many leaders, if not most, in the privileged global north seem oblivious or apathetic to the carnage. And, I, and I'm really unclear why Ken 
limited this to leaders uh, in the privileged global north? Is he suggesting that leaders in the unprivileged global south uh, are not apathetic to the carnage all around them? Anyway, this is Ken's uh, sermon, not mine. I will ask him that question if I get to talk to him. All around the planet, wildlife populations are in a free fall from birds to amphibians to mammals to marine life to insects. But today, the interest of capital and capitalist not only dominate our economic, media, and political order, they dominate our consciousness. The Latin meaning for Homo sapiens is wise man, but as I ponder our precarious pr pr position on the precipice of the sixth mass extinction, I cannot help but be struck by its glaring irony. Wise man. Uh huh. <clears throat> Standing in a cemetery crowded with the bones of countless species, I am left with little room to marvel at our cleverness. The magicians and merchants of corporate consumerism have fostered this pernicious disconnection from the natural world and have created a labyrinth of distractions and doubts that numb the senses to our own looming demise. <clears throat> it is a difficult box to break free from. <clears throat> Insipid optimism is demanded of all <coughs> subjects of the global corporate kingdom. Those who defy it are often derided or ridiculed as alarmist. Sometimes they are rendered invisible. It is a kind of optimism that eschews facts a cult of thinking that chides anyone who dares look at things as they truly are. But to deny the ecocide unfolding before us today is a feat of astounding absurdity, and it should be clear to anyone paying attention that this is not a natural event. Human beings have become a force of nature, and an extraction and exploitation economy that benefits fewer and fewer people each year has created the conditions that are leading toward the collapse of the biosphere on which we <coughs> all depend. <coughs> Thanks to decades of indoctrination, however, we have been meticulously trained to ignore, downplay, or rebrand capitalism, a planet-killing ideology which separates living beings into worthiness categories for the wealth accumulation of a few. <coughs> It is ushered in an age where one species is decimated, where when one species is decimated, another previously less desirable species is turned to for unbridled exploitation. Haddock, cod, and tuna were ruthlessly harvested until their numbers crashed catastrophically, so fish like farmed tilapia were <coughs> up-marketed to replace them. And this is not only true of fish populations. Biodiverse forests are scraped away for more profitable monocrops like palm oil, with the result being a catastrophic loss of habitat for scores of species 
such as the endangered orangutan. Mountain tops are blown to smithereens, and once pristine streams are buried under tons of toxic ash for mere minutes of electricity. Plastics continue to be manufactured for one-time use while the detritus lasts millennia, dumped into the world's oceans by the truckload every minute of every day, choking hundreds of thousands of species of birds, turtles, whales, and other marine life. Indigenous habitats are sponged off the landscape to make room for squalid factory farms that sentence millions of sentient beings to a life of unimaginable terror, cruelty, and gruesome horror, all to meet the demand for cheap and unhealthy fast food. And the ever untouchable war industry continues to decimate wildlife. In fact, the U.S. military has been cited as one of the world's biggest polluters and contributor to global climate change. But ours is a culture that encourages denial, obfuscation, and distraction. It relies on our indifference and uses it to rob us of our collective agency. After all, paying attention hmm, might cause us to question aloud the entire premise on which this madness is based and demand radical, systemic, and societal change. The choice, however, is ultimately ours. We can continue to avert our gaze from the looming chaos and believe the lie fed to us that we are separate or even superior <clears throat> to the life web that envelops this planet. We can sleepwalk toward extinction with a shopping bag in one hand and the latest smartphone in the other. Or we can acknowledge sorrow as a natural response to catastrophe. In grief, we make a choice to not only honor the countless species that have already been lost, but to oppose the ongoing carnage, recognize our part in it, especially in the global north, and realize that we too are subject to extinction. It is in no way accepting things as they are or giving up and it is not a solitary affair either. Stepping into our grief is indeed bearing witness to the monstrous crime of ecocide. It is a bold act of defiance to a culture of denial, distraction, and death. Grief is the beginning of transformation, and acknowledging it with sincerity leads a voice of testimony that can lead toward revolutionary dissent. It is the only coherent answer to an imposed and unnatural extinction, but it is also a rallying cry for solidarity and rebellion. Indeed, this may be the last chance we have left to make a stand on a dying world. Thank you, uh, Ken Orphan, for perfectly summing up the situation on our dying, collapsing planet 
here uh, in the final two days <clears throat> of 2018 as all of the uh, clueless morons <clears throat> make plans for the big New Year's Eve party is tomorrow, where, of course, Sancho Ponza and I will be heading <clears throat> to the last picking party to make a joyful noise with my uh, clueless, lovable friends to bid farewell to 2018 and uh, roll out the yellow brick road <coughs> leading to 2019. <clears throat> oh boy. Put on your seat belts and buckle up. It's going to be a wild ride. <clears throat> Smoke them if you got them and get out there and enjoy 2018 while you still can. And I'm going to head out to my garden on this dreary day to harvest some organic turnip greens to cheer up my palate. Bye, guys.